Hi, I'm Lois. I'm the clerk of adult education at Arch Street Meeting. I'm here to introduce Susanna Dodson, who is a big fan of Jessamine West. She will be talking about the Quaker Reader. Oh, here is Susanna. Thank you, Lois. And I, I'm a huge fan of Jessamine West. And, and let me tell you something about her first. Um, she was born in 1902 and died in 1984. So she's been dead nearly 40 years. Um, she was an extremely prolific writer, and she's well known for being a close relative of Richard Milhouse Nixon, who was the President of the United States. Her mother was a Miss Milhouse. I'm not quite sure that whether that she was a first cousin or a second cousin, but I know they both um, went to the same meeting in Whittier in California. Now, Jessamine was born in 1902 and died in 1984, as I said. Um, Richard Nixon was born in um, 1913 and died in 1994. So she was um, somewhat older than he, than he was. Jessamine West wrote an enormous amount. I mean, before we even get started here, this is a huge book and every word is well thought out. Um, but she was also, she wrote a lot of fiction. And I, I have um, made it a hobby of mine trying to collect all her books of fiction. One of the books that she wrote was called Fem A Friendly Persuasion, which was made into a Hollywood movie. Um, and she also, apparently, according to her bio, she wrote a number of um, screenplays as well. So she was heavily into, um, into, in, into writing. So that, that, that's Jessamine. And she was a lifelong Quaker. Now her ancestors and Richard Nixon's ancestors originally were in Philadelphia and then they kept moving west. So they moved to Indiana and then to California as um, farmlands opened up and opportunities opened up. So she was actually born in Indiana. When her, when she was very sick as a young woman, I can't remember what she had. But while she was um, getting better, the mother was telling her stories about moving, about Indiana and, and moving to California. So this, this actually is the basis of a lot of her fiction stories. And I, I tell you, if you can get hold of her fiction stories, I mean, some of them are really funny. Can you imagine Quaker humor? I mean, it's really funny. So, but anyway, that 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 is her. Um, now, this book, I it, it's interesting. I, I can't get a get an idea of how long it took to write. I I, I would think a book like this would take um, a whole lot of people, you know, a few decades. But she seems to have just whipped it off. And what she did was she went to, uh, her husband was a, a school teacher who became the superintendent of schools and, and they didn't have children. So, and he was very supportive of her. And she was going around to all these libraries um, reading books. Well, and she went all around England, all around the United States. And um, she clearly, this, she clearly knew the Philadelphia Quakers. Um, Thomas Kelly um, is, she talks about him. Thomas Kelly was a, a Philadelphia Quaker. Um, I mean, she, she knew him personally. She, I imagine she knew a lot of people that we've heard of personally. You know, like Gary Cooper. Wasn't he in Friendly Persuasion? Anyway. So it's Quaker chronology. I, I don't have any slides because I thought that would be um, I didn't think that would be helpful. So it, it, it's, I'm, I'm basically just speaking and occasionally holding things up. So the first thing she did with the Quaker chronology was she, she laid out what was happening. And on one side, she has, um, I really hope you can get hold of this book so you can read it yourself. Um, Pendle Hill has a whole lot of copies. 
They This was first published in 1962, and Pendle Hill got hold of it and republished it in 1992. And they have a whole lot of copies which you can buy. And I bought some copies for I think it was 16, 17 dollars. So I always have copies with me because it's just such a terrific book. So she starts off with 1624, which was the birth of uh, George Fox. So Queen Elizabeth was already dead. Um, King James VI of Scotland became King James I of England. And then he went nuts and was going around burning, burning healers as witches. There are all sorts of awful things happening. She doesn't talk about that, but I, that's something that I know about. Um, so here she's got, um, on the other side of the chronology, she, she has the general history of what was happening at the time that, that Quakers started. Uh, 1652, George Fox was on Pendle Hill, but he'd already been um, gathering. Um, okay, so it was 1624 he was born, 1652 he was um, 20... 28. Um, that's when he had this vision on um, Pendle Hill. And we generally say that Quakers started in 1652. But actually, he started to preach in 1647. Now, the Civil War in England was going on around this time. The Civil War was 1641 to 1651. And in the middle of this, they chopped the head off the king, Charles II, which was an extraordinary act because there was this belief that a king was put there by God. And if you cut off a, cut off the head of a king, you were, you, I mean, you were doing a really bad thing. Um, and then Oliver Cromwell um, was the Lord Protector of England from 1653 to 1658. Now, why I'm even mentioning this is because um, George Fox met Oliver Cromwell and um, chatted with him, which is pretty extraordinary. So the people that, that he knew um, included William Penn. He convinced William Penn. He convinced a, a, a lot of people. Anyway, I, I really don't want to go through the whole um, Quaker history, because that will that will take too long. I just want to read you some some passages. Um, but anyway, what what she's done with the book, she's just gone through and she's she's reproduced excerpts from writers of Quakers from sixteen fifties, sixteen well, yeah, and after that. So what I'm what I'll do is it's like what is a quake? What what was so extraordinary about a quake before we read that? Part one, the beginnings. So Gerald Bullitt, and Gerald Bullitt is talking about why Quakers are different than everyone else. What is it about the thought process of a Quaker that was different from anyone else? Um, and he Gerald Bullitt was not a Quaker. He talks about Quakers. And um, the doctrine, and, and this, is, this is actually very interesting, the doctrine of predestination, this is um, Gerald Bullitt, who was uh, lived until the, he was a 20th century writer. The doctrine of predestination, by which Calvin is chiefly remembered today, differs from atheistic determinism only in being infinitely more horrible, but because it affirms the immortality of the soul an existence of an implacable deity. Now, why he's talking about Calvin is because Calvinism is like the opposite of Quakers. To know God was to know God was for Calvin the supreme end of human endeavor. Though it is difficult to see what profit or satisfaction there could be in knowing a God who created men with the deliberate intention of tormenting them forever but an arbitrarily selecting, selecting a few. So that was the big argument. I remember we had this argument when, when I was in high school, um, predestination or self-will. And apparently that's, that's the core of Calvinism, is you are predestined 
to burn in hell. And there's nothing you can do to be good. And this is the difference between Quakers and everyone else. For a Quaker, you can be perfect. But the Protestant religions, you can't be because, you know, we all were, we all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. The Quakers are saying, wait a minute, you can be good. If you do, if you do all the right things, you can be, which, are, was, which is a, a fascinating concept. The fact is, though, that when Quakers first showed up, people were incredibly hostile to them, putting them in jail, even hanging them. Um, what happened to uh, James Naylor? Um, a bee branded on his forehead and a hot nail poked through his tongue. What, what was it that was just so extraordinary about Quakers? Okay, well, let's talk about, this is the same, this is the same chapter from um, Gerald Bullock. He, he talks about Robert Barclay. Now, it sounds like I'm jumping around, but really not. Robert Barclay was the first Quaker theologian um, who wrote, and he wrote in Latin something called the, the Apology, the Apologia, and he wrote down everything about what, what being a Quaker meant. Um, so Robert Barclay is, is like, well, like the, the first one. No, but Robert Barclay is interesting because he was the, the son of a lord and his mother was a Gordon of the Gordon, Lord Gordon. They were very, very wealthy. And uh, Barclay was made the governor of um, New Jersey because Penn um, sold half of his land in New Jersey to uh, 12 people, 11 of whom were Quakers, and one of them was, uh, was Robert Barclay. <laughs> it's just, it's just, just seems so wrong on so many parts that, but that's it. He's talking about George Fox. He became, once he found himself, a great disputer, a man of many words, but all his words amounted to little more than the assertion that religion, God, is nothing if not an inward experience, which is the testimony of the mystic in all ages. In 17th century Protestantism, he found and hotly repudiated two stupidities which survive in an attenuated form even today. Bibliolatry, the fetishist worship of the Old and New Testament, and that doctrine of total human depravity, which implies the utter separation of man from God. Against these traditional tenets of Protestantism, he affirmed the inwardness of authority and the presence of God in every human soul. His opponents could not endure to hear of purity of conscience and of victory over sin. Again and again, he tells us of how the professors, by which he means professed believers in religion, pleaded for sin. He found among these men no one who in the crisis of, young, of his young manhood could speak to his condition. They seemed to him to be eaten up with notions, concerned only with the mechanical observance of ceremonies and with preaching doctrines that were either plainly or untrue or spiritually null and void. How about that? And now I'm turning to George Fox wrote, wrote um, his autobiography, greatly helped by, I believe, um, Thomas Elwood and the Penningtons, who were in and out of jail. I'm not quite sure when they ever got a chance to do it. But, uh, but, but the book of John of George Fox, which, of course, is way off copyright. You can get it from Gutenberg Press. You can get it from anywhere. And you should read it because it's phenomenal. Um, it really is. So this is, I'm, I'm going to read you from George Fox's journal a, um, the examination of George Fox before the judge at Lancaster concerning the Oath of Allegiance, 1663. Now, this Oath of Allegiance, there was an Oath of Allegiance in 1664. 
you, uh, there was a law that you couldn't, um, that you could only have five unrelated people in a gathering. And this was all to try and stop Quakers from meeting, in meeting for worship. But anyway, this is the examination of George Fox before the judge at Lancaster concerning the oath of allegiance, 1663. George Fox was called before Judge Twiston, being a prisoner at the place for said, Apple said, Judge, what? Do you come into the court with your hat on? Then the jailer took it off which probably means, <laughs> right. George Fox, peace be amongst you all. The hat is not the honour that came down from God. Ooh. Judge, will you take the oath of allegiance, George Fox? George Fox, I never took an oath in my life, covenant nor engagement. Judge, will you swear or no? George Fox, Christ commands me not to swear at all and the Apostle James likewise. I am neither Turk nor Jew nor heathen, but a Christian and should show forth Christianity. Do you not know that the Christians in primitive times refused swearing in the days of the 10 persecutions and some of the martyrs in Queen Mary's days because Christ and the apostles had forbidden it? Had you, that was Queen Mary of England, Bloody Mary. 1553 to 1558. Have you not experienced enough how many men at first swore for the king and then against the king? Whether must I obey God or man? I put it to thee, so judge thee. Judge, I will not dispute with thee, George Fox. Come, read the oath to him. And so the oath is read. Judge, give him the book. And so a man that stood by me held up the book and said, lay your hands upon the book. George Fox, give me the book in my hand, which set them all a-gazing, as I hope I would have sworn. Then when I got the book in my hand, I held it up and said, it is commanded in this book not to swear at all. If it be a Bible, I will prove it. I bet he drove everyone nuts. And I saw it was a Bible and I held it up and then they plucked it out of my hand again and said, will you swear? Will you take the oath of allegiance, yea or nay? George Fox, my allegiance to the king lies not in oaths, but in truth and faithfulness, for I honour all men, much more the king. But Christ said, I must not swear, the great prophet, the saviour of the world and the judge of the world. And thou sayest, I must swear, whether must I obey Christ or thee? For it is in tenderness of conscience that I do not swear, in obedience to the command of Christ and the Apostle. And for his sake I suffer, and in obedience to his command do I stand this day. And we have the word of a king for tender consciences, consciences besides his speeches and declarations at Berea. Dost thou own the king? Judge. Yes, I own the king. Woo. George Fox. Then why dost thou not own his speeches and de declarations concerning tender conscience? It is in obedience to Christ, the Saviour of the world and the judge of the world, for whose judgment seat all must be brought, that I do not swear, and I am a man of tender conscience. I think own meant, meant something different in the 1600s than it, than it means now. I think it means belief or something like that. And then the judge stood up. I will not be afraid of thee, George Fox. Thou speakest so loud, thy voice drowns mine and the courts. I must call for three or four cries to drown thy voice. Thou hast good lungs. George Fox, I am a prisoner here this day for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake that made heaven and earth. And for his sake I suffer. And for him do I stand this day. And if my voice were five times louder, Yes, yet should I shout it out and lift it up for Christ's sake. Well, yeah. So it goes on. He's just he's just driving the judge nuts. And here's another case. He's talking to someone else. And this is also in George Fox's um, journal. And after a while, I went, so they kept releasing him and putting him back. So here he was released. 
And after a while, I went to visit Esquire Marsh, and he was at dinner, and he sent for me up. And there were several great persons at dinner with him, and he would have had me sit down with him to dinner, but I was not free. And he said to a great papist then there, here is a Quaker which you have not seen before. And the papist asked me whether I did own the christening of children. That's that word own again. And I told him there was no scripture for any such practice. What, said he, not for christening children? And I said, nay. But if, if he meant the one baptism with the spirit into one body, that we own. But to throw a little water on a child's face, and say it was baptized or christened, there was no scripture for that. Whew. Then he asked me whether I did own the Catholic Church, Catholic faith. I said, yes, but neither the Pope nor the Papists were in that Catholic faith. For the true Catholic faith, faith works by love and purifies the heart. And if they were in that faith that gives victory, by which they might have access to God, they would not tell people of a purgatory after their death. So I would prove that neither the Pope nor Papists that held up purgatory were in the true faith, for the true, precious, and divine faith which Christ is the author of is victory over the devil and sin that has separated man and woman from God. Yeah, he's pretty intense. So Thomas Elwood was a contemporary. He was 1639. 1714. Now George Fox was 1620, was born in 1624. So Thomas Elwood was born 15 years later. And then William Penn was born in 1644. So William Penn was 20 years younger than George Fox. James Naylor was older than George Fox. He was born in 1618. Okay, so I've, I've got all that. So here we are, we're talking about Thomas Elwood. 1630, born in 1639, died in 1714. Now, Thomas Elwood was an interesting character. Thomas Elwood wrote a, a fabulous story, and I, I'll just read some of it, and I'll, I'll skip because it goes on for 20 pages, which we don't, we don't need to read. You know, it's interesting. Um, in the age of Twitter and emails, we're a lot more concise. Um, these people just went on and on. I mentioned before that during my father's abode in London and in the time of the civil wars, he con contracted a friendship with the Lady Springett, then a widow, and after afterwards married to Isaac Kennington, Esquire, to continue, which he sometimes visited them at their lodge near Reading. And having heard that they had come to live in their own estate at Chalfont in Buckinghamshire, about 15 miles from Crowell, he went one day to visit them and to return at night, taking me with him. So this is Tom Selwood's father, is taking along young Tom, who was 20. But very much surprised we were when being come thither, we first heard, then found, they would become Quakers, a people we had no knowledge of, and a name we had till then scarce heard of. This was in 1659. This was really at the early stages. It might even have been earlier than that. So great a change from a free, debonair, and courtly sort of behavior, which we found formerly had found them in, to so strict to gravity as they now received us, with, did not a little amuse us and disappoint our expectations. Of For my part, I sought and at length found means to cast myself into the company of the daughter, whom I found gathering some flowers in the garden, attended by her maid. Who was also a Quaker. So <laughs> the, whole, the whole family and the whole household all became Quakers at once. But when I addressed myself to her after her, my accustomed manner with intention to engage her in some discourse which might introduce conversation on the footing of our former acquaintance, though she treated me with a courteous mien, yet as young as she was, the gravity of her look and behavior struck such an awe upon me that I found myself not so much master of myself as to pursue any further converse with her. Wherefore, asking pardon for my boldness, I withdrew. We stayed dinner, which was very handsome, 
and lack nothing to re recommend but want of mirth and pleasant discourse. So Pennington's, they're all just <laughs> sitting around being serious, my gosh. Yet this good effect that this had upon my father, who was then in the commission of peace, that it disposed him to a more favorable opinion of and carriage towards those people when they came into his, as long after one of them did, as not long after. Sometime after this, my father, having gotten some further account of, of the people called Quaker, because everything was still, and being desirous of being informed concerning their principles, made another visit to Isaac and his wife. So this was in 1659. He went back. And during this visit, El Edward Burrow was there, as well as Thomas Curtis, who I don't know who that was, and James Naylor. James Naylor was a, an extremely gifted speaker. And um, he convinced Thomas Edmondson. James Naylor had been a soldier. I mean, they were all soldiers. There was a civil war going on. Um, and Thomas Edmondson was a soldier. And he listened to James Naylor and became convinced that, um, okay, I keep talking about what are they convinced of? They're convinced that we all have access to the divine power ourselves. We don't need to go through priests. We don't need to read um, holy books. We have access. And that is why our meeting for worship is called a meeting, because we are meeting directly with the divine. That's, that, I believe, is the core of what the convince, con convincement is. James Naylor, um, as I said, Thomas Edmondson was convinced after listening to James Naylor, and he moved to Lurgan in Ireland, and my ancestors went with him, and they, and they were all connected with the linen industry in Lurgan. And my mother's grandfather was still running his linen factory in Belfast in the early 1900s. And now all linen is made in China. So that was the end of that. But that's what the Quakers were doing in Ireland because there was a tax on wool. So they, they couldn't have sheep because English, I, I mean, I, I don't understand how you can tax your own country, but anyway. That's beside the point. But we're going to be talking about James Naylor a bit. I just wanted to explain that. So Thomas Elwood then, he's gone to dinner twice. The second time he's met James Naylor and uh, Edward Burroughs. And then he decides that he wants to be a Quaker. He was just so moved by what he heard, by what he spoke. And before long, he was sneaking out of his house where he lived with his father. And um, apparently he had two hats and uh, some kind of a cap. And he came to his father and didn't take his hat off. And he didn't bow. And that's what the Quakers were doing. That was their civil disobedience. They weren't taking their hats off. And his, he came to his father's house and refused to take his hat off and called him thee and thou. And his father just took his hat that was the end of his hat. And his second hat, his father did the same thing. So then he had to wear a cap. So, but and his father took away his horse so that he couldn't go to Quaker meetings. So he walked. So I mean, so he was getting all kinds of pushback from his own from his own father. And he ended up in prison a few times. The sub okay, this was the meeting that they had that convinced him. The subject of the discourse was remember, he's 20 years old. This is 1659. His name is Thomas Elwood. And he has been brought to the Quaker understanding that we are in charge of ourselves, that, it, that we are connected directly to the divine. That's really what it is. The universal free grace, free grace of God to all mankind to which he opposed the Calvinistic tenet of particular and personal predestination. So this is Thomas Elwood writing this, in defense of which indefensible notion 
he found himself more at a loss than he expected. This is Edward Burroughs speaking. Edward Burroughs said not much to him upon it, although what he said was close and cogent. But James Naylor interposing handled the subject with so much perspicuity and clear demonstration that his reasoning seemed to be irresistible. And so I suppose my father found it, which made him willing to drop the discourse. Oh, I'm sorry. They were talking to um, his Tom, Thomas Elwood's father. So that's that's what he was trying to tell him. He was trying to tell him that Calvin was wrong. There's no predestination. We all have the ability to be good people. We are all children of God. He wasn't. Um, he wasn't highly educated. He was clearly reasonably educated because he could read and write, and he could obviously speak, and he was obviously could think. Um, but he he didn't have this high Oxbridge education that a lot of the followers did. And that actually is something that's very interesting. And Jessamine West talks about that, about the interest that scientists have in, have in becoming Quakers. There was a um, very brilliant physicist in England. His name was Arthur Stanley Eddington. And, and he lived from... He was the person that brought the theory of relativity to England because in the First World War, you weren't allowed to be reading German scientific papers. And of course, Albert Einstein was writing in German. And um, his papers um, came to Arthur Stanley Eddington. Albert Einstein's papers came first to him. And he was just blown away by it. And he talked about that. And he 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 didn't meet um, Einstein for, for some years. Okay, he was born 1882 and died in 1944. So he was the same age as my grandparents. And he discovered nu nuclear fusion. Um, and as I said, he was he, he was brought up a Quaker, and he was um, his. And he remained a Quaker all his life. And this is something he said. Religious creeds, this is very interesting. Religious creeds are a great obstacle to any full sympathy between the outlook of the scientists and the outlook which religion is so often opposed to, supposed to require. I recognize that the practice of a religious community cannot be regulated solely in the interests of its scientifically minded members. And therefore, I would not go so far as to urge that no kind of defense of creeds is possible. But I think it may be said, Quakerism in dispensing with creeds holds out a hand to the scientists. The scientific objection is not merely to particular creeds which assert in outworn phraseology beliefs which are either no longer held or no longer convey inspiration to life. The spirit of seeking which animates us, refuses to regard any kind of creed as its goal. I like that. It would be a shock to come across a university where it was the practice of the students to recite adherence to Newton's law of motion, to Maxwell's equations, and to the electromagnetic theory of light. We should not deplore it the less if our own pet theory has, happens to be included, or if the list were brought up to date every few years. We should say that the students cannot possibly realize the intention of scientific training if they are taught to look on these results as things to be recited and subscribed to. Science may fall short of its ideal, and although the peril scarcely takes this extreme form, it is not always easy, particularly in popular science, to maintain our stand against creed and dogma. I would not be sorry to borrow for our scientific pronouncements the passage prefixed to the advices to the Society of Friends in 1656 and repeated in the current general advices. And this is this is a quote. These things we do not lay upon you as a rule or form to walk by, but that all with a measure of the light, which is pure and holy, may be guided 
and so in the light, walking and abiding. These things must be fulfilled in the spirit, not in the letter, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. It's beautiful. He tried to be a conscientious objector, but they didn't want him to be because they decided he was too useful in the First World War, but they decided he was too useful as a scientist. And um, they kept on denying him um, conscientious objection status, and then finally the war ended. But he took a, an exhibition to go look at a solar eclipse in 1919, and he discovered that light bends, which was what Einstein was talking about. So, I mean, I, I, I just, yeah, that's really nice. And he wrote a poem <laughs> because, you know, we all have silly sides. Oh, leave the wise our measures to collate on things. One thing at least is certain. Light has weight. I'll read it again. Oh, leave the wise our measures to collate. One thing at least is certain. Light has weight. One thing is certain, and there is no debate. Light rays show near the sun. Do not go straight. Okay. How about that? That, that was what he did. I, um, I wanted to go back to James Naylor. James Naylor, um, he was in prison. And apparently, I think he must have been like a chick magnet. But he got out of prison and these three women kind of swarmed around him and they put him on a donkey and he walked through Bristol on Good Friday and they were saying Hosanna and all these kind of, they got a little carried away. And so he was in prison for blasphemy, which is pretty shocking. And, um, yeah. They beat him. Branded a bee on his forehead for blasphemy. And then got a red hot nail and nailed it through his tongue. Eventually they let him out of prison and he was walking back to wherever he was going and um, some robbers beat him up, left him for dead. So he was taken back to his place. He, 24 hours, in the two hours before he died, he wrote something which is very famous in Quaker circles. A statement of, of his faith, which is really, he, but he, he really, he, he just rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way. And one of the ladies, apparently he, he had a wife and he sort of abandoned. And um, she had a husband she'd abandoned. And they looked at each other and they didn't leave each other for three days. And people noticed this. So as I said, he was, he was a bit of a chick magnet, but obviously an extraordinary speaker. Now this is page 122, okay. So there he was in the last two hours of his life, calling for pen and paper. Uh, and, and another thing too, all of his sufferings, he didn't complain which was, was noted by everyone. I mean, while he was being, you know, nailed and branded and pilloried, people were standing around watching and absolutely in awe of how he was, how, how, how he was accepting it. So this is the dying, these are the dying words of James Naylor, which I, I, you, maybe you've heard it before, but it's very beautiful. There is a spirit which I feel is that delights to do no evil, nor to avenge, to revenge any wrong, but delights to endure all things in hope to enjoy its own in the end. Its hope is to outlive all wrath and contention and to weary out all exultation and cruelty or whatever is of a nature contrary to itself. It sees to the end of all temptations as it bears no evil in itself so it conceives none in thoughts to any other. If it be betrayed, it bears it, for its ground and spring is the mercies and forgiveness of God. Its crown is meekness. Its life is everlasting love unfeigned. It takes its kingdom with entreaty 
and not with contention, and keeps it by lowliness of mind. In God alone it can rejoice, though none else regard it or can own its life. It's conceived in sorrow and brought forth without any to pity it, nor doth it murmur at grief and oppression. It never rejoiceth, but through sufferings, for with the world's joy it is murdered. I found it alone, being forsaken. I have fellowship therein with them who live in dens and desolate places in the earth, who through death obtain this resurrection and eternal hold of life. Thou, thou wast with me when I fled from the face of mine enemies. Then didst thou warn me in the night. Thou carriedst me in thy power into the hiding place thou hadst prepared me. There thou coveredst me with thy hand, that in time thou mightst bring me forth a rock before all the world. When I was weak, thou stayedst me with thy hand, that in thy time thou mightst Present me to the world in thy strength in which I stand and cannot be moved. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let this be written for those that come after. Praise the Lord. I just think that's beautiful.